Hello, um, this is a video on phylogenetic comparative methods and um, this is going to be one, the first video uh, out of a series of videos I'm planning to make um, and this one will be the very very introductory video. So in this video I'll break down phylogenetic comparative, comparative methods into the most fundamental bits, uh, the most core and important bits and especially uh, uh, talking about why it's important to consider phylogeny in your comparative analyses. So if you have data across species, that'll be comparative data. And in your comparative data sets, uh, you ought to be uh, analyzed using comparative methods, phylogenetic comparative methods. And I'll explain why. Um, however, maybe, um, you know, maybe you're skeptic about this. Maybe you've tested it on data where, you know, applying phylogenetic comparative methods it doesn't really change much of the statistics or the qualitative outcomes, so you don't really think it's necessary. What's the whole point? Maybe, you know, or maybe you're just starting out, you don't really know the basics, but you want to know a bit more than this video. You know, if it would be for you for either type of people, it's more it's the fundamentals, and I explain why it's so important. So, uh, to begin with, um, questions in paleobiology can be addressed through data analyses. So as long as you've got some kind of data, comparative data, there's a lot of questions that you can answer or vice versa, more importantly, if you've got some key questions in paleobiology, like do animals get bigger through time, uh, such as Cope's rule, are taxa after mass extinction smaller than those before, this will be the Lillipult effect, or do species evolve faster when they exploit a new ecological niche, such as quantum evolution that George Sim K. Lord Simpson Sorry, G.G. Simpson uh, postulated, uh, you know, almost like 75 years ago or so. And all of these questions can be answered through various different types of data analyses. For instance, the first one about Culp's row, there's an example here about pterosaurs getting bigger through time. Um, and also things like whether small taxa after mass extinction event are smaller than their predecessors could be tested by body size data. Um, across different time events, across a mass extinction event, for instance, right? And lastly, quantum evolution can be tested through um, phenotypic data. And, you know, if you can assign them different adaptive zones, for instance, if there's a transition, maybe the rate of evolution along that transition might be faster than uh, the within adaptive zone evolution, for instance. So these can be analyzed through data. So data, um, you know, when, when you've got data, you usually start off with data collection. So you collect data and data collection involves sampling from a population. So it's often very difficult or if not impossible to actually collect data from the entire population. So you're, um, you opt to take a sample of it. In statistics, these observations that, that you know, the data that you've collected um, in a sample are assumed to be independent. So that, that means that they, there's, there's no, um, interrelationships or interdependencies between the data points that you've collected in your sample, that your sample are independent of each other. And in uh, modern, if you're using like um, data collecting regimes in uh, some kind of surveying, for instance, and you're surveying customer satisfaction, or you're um, getting some kind of census data, health data, uh, in you know, in, in in your population is actually the people that you know live in a certain country or a certain region or something. There's all these various methods available to attain independent sampling. So there's like you know sampling regimes that you follow to ensure that you got a fair and independent sampling. However, in uh, comparative data, so that's across species data. So when you're talking about biological biodiversity data. The comparative data sets are not independent. So you can't, you're not really sampling randomly uh, with respect to each other. And the way that these tax are not independent of each other is that some of the tax are more closely related than others. So for instance, in this example, the sparrow and the, the sauropod is more closely related to each other than they are, either of them are to pterosaurs or you know further away than crocodiles. So the cross tip, the, the comparisons across the tips are not actually equivalent uh, between the different pairings. Um, and then, you know, this, this um, non-independence is structured in a um, phylogenetic and evolutionary way. So this basically the comparative data contains signatures of evolutionary history. 
And so I've said this before, all comparisons, these peer pairwise comparisons are not equivalent. You can't really compare them uh, as if they're equal because they're not independent of each other. So this is the structure of the non-independence is that you have this hierarchical uh, evolutionary, uh, sorry, hierarchical phylogenetic um, non-independence that contains signatures of evolution. Um, so then this non-independence, which is often called phylogenetic non-independence, is um, it owes to shared ancestry or whether it means that the phylogeny is responsible for this or the phylogenetic structure is there inherently. So the phylogenetic non-independent structure can be then represented as something called a phylogenetic variance covariance matrix. Um, so if we take this phylogeny as an example, you can convert this into a phylogenetic VCV or variance covariance matrix where this diagonal bit is the distance from the root to each of the tips, so A, B, C, and D here. And then from the root to the tip, it's one step, one branch length here, one branch length here, and two here. So the, the entire distance from here to the tip is four. And this is all four to the tip because we're taking an ultrametric uh, tree as an example. The off diagonals then are the pairwise shared paths between the tips. So between B and A, they share two units of time uh no sorry they share two units of time here from the root to the common ancestor of a and b because that's one and two and if we look at c and a uh c and a the shared common pathway is just this one unit of time and that's the same for b and c and then d doesn't have any shared pathway with any of these others so it's all zeros so this is basically the structure of this non-independence based on phylogeny that you can represent as a a matrix. So now this is quite important um, when you're calculating statistics. So um, and most statistical tests rely on calculating variances. And the variances is kind of in another way it's a bit like a spread how spread the data is. And um, this is where the small bit little bit of math comes in. It's the calculation to calc uh, for variance is basically the uh, squared sum of the distances between the each of the data and the mean of the, that data divided by the, the number of the sample. Um, in the phylogenetic terms, the, the mean of that sample is the root estimate. So this is the phylogenetically corrected mean is the root estimate. So if you think about it this way, the, the, the average, the x bar, the mean x bar is actually the root estimate. So the individual differences between the tips and the root is actually this bit here, xa minus the x bar. But if you look at this, if you compare xa and xb, xa minus x bar and xb minus x bar, this bit is actually redundant. So you're counting this bit twice because um, you go here to a and you go here to b. So you're counting this, this shared pathway twice. And then this bit here is counted three times because it's shared between the three tips. And so this, this kind of um, redundancy is actually inherent in, like for instance, variance calculation, but then other statistics as well. And that's why comparative methods then would, um, in a way, weight or downweight according to this structure. Um, not, so this non-independence is a problem in statistics because it violates that statistical assumption of independence. Statistical tests assume that. They assume independence. And comparative data are non-independent, so it violates this assumption. The consequences are that statistical tests are compromised. That means that, well, in, in a, probably the easiest way to say is that the p-values are unreliable and it has inflated type 1 error rates. So p, right, p value is, is here, for instance, if you have a, uh, let's, this is an example of log bite force against log body mass, and you see this, this uh, relationship. So you fit a, a regression line and calculate confidence intervals, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a slope beta value. And there's an R squared value that's associated with it. And this is the p value. So that's a very significant relationship between these two variables, for instance, right? But this p value is gonna be um, compromised. So maybe your, if your, relationship is is quite sign like the significance isn't that strong it could be, be basically be compromised and you might you might be either uh failing to reject uh true null hypothesis for instance so then i mentioned type 1 error before but that's a case where it's called uh, false positive 
So it's rejecting a true null hypothesis. So an example of this is like convicting an innocent defendant. So you're making an error uh, in your statistics. Um, so that could happen if you don't account for the non-independence. So then there's the suite of analytical methods called phylogenetic comparative methods that are available and statistical framework to take into account phylogenetic non-independence. Um, and there's these, these uh, phylogenetic comparative methods are available for most statistical tests and models. So there, for instance, there's a phylogenetic version of t-test, a phylogenetic ANOVA, phylogenetic regression, and phylogenetic generalized least uh, squares uh, just for generalized linear models. So these are uh, kind of like extensions of regression, but in a different, using for different types of data, for instance. Um, so the, these are available to uh, test statistics while accounting for phylogeny. And the sophistication and methods allowed for complex models of trait evolution. So um, initially, phylogeny comparative methods was a way to account for non-independence in data but it's pretty much evolved um, into a lot more complex parameterizations that allow for various different types of, of modeling, like testing for rates of evolution um, and then fitting various different types of evolution models, like um, basically being able to infer processes underlying the generation of data, for instance. The method, to, um, the, the different types of tests and methods to use depends on the type of phenotypic traits so, you know, continuous varying traits are a very common kind of data. So the data take values along a continuum. So between, well, it, there's no real um, distinct intervals. And these are usually things like phenotypic measurements, like uh, femur lengths or skull length or body mass. Um, and, you know, there's a suite of methods available for this type of data. And another type of data is the discrete traits. So these are values that take clear and discernible states. So for instance, a binary data might be a zero to one or a presence absence data or categorical or multi-state data. So it could be like diet where you have carnivore, herbivore, omnivore or habitat, which is like um, well, open or grasslands or you know, covered or woodlands. And these are different categories. So it's like size categories as well, so, um, small, medium, large, and then posture in mammals like the plantigrade, digitigrade, or ungulate. And so these are discrete categorical multiples, multi-state. And there's different types of models and methods available to, to analyze these different things. Um, so that's the end of this uh, lecture. But so I'm just going to talk about continuous states in another video. And then I'll talk about this discrete traits in a different video. So this was the end this, for this one. Um, it just covers the basics and the fundamentals. Um, well, I, I hope that was clear enough. And that if it wasn't too easy, even if it, this wasn't too easy, then um, me, you know, I can make another one to try to do, use a different examples, for instance, or you know, if you can leave a comment or whatever, uh, get in touch, and I, you know, take some feedback, or maybe maybe there's different ways of communicating this. So uh, thank you for watching, and uh, stay tuned for more of this type of video.